On this program, we're going to continue our study in our new book, The Mystery of the Menorah. Behind me, you see the seven golden lamps of the lampstand, called in the King James Version of the Bible, the seven golden candlesticks. And uh, the fascinating things that we have learned about this have been compiled over the past year and placed into our book some 300 pages, The Mystery of the Menorah. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me this fascinating book and its mm. subject. J.R., the seven golden lamps are not just seven separate lamps, they are interconnected in a most amazing way. And as we have discussed and will continue to discuss today, the center of those seven lamps, called the Shamish in Hebrew, the servant lamp, is the lamp that represents the work and particularly the person of Christ who is our servant lamp. And you know, J.R., this is very, very easily illustrated in a story that comes from the first century, right around the time that the Lord was crucified, was buried, and then rose again, <clears throat> the Shamish in the temple. That is, in the temple menorah, the Shamish, the center lamp, the servant lamp, went out, and it couldn't be relit. And for the next 40 years, for the next 40 years, there was no lighting of that lamp. They tried, they put a fresh wick in it, they put new oil, fresh oil. It would not light. There was something supernatural about that. I think God was trying to tell them. In fact, the, the uh, rabbis have written in the Talmud, in a book called Yoma, that uh, God must have been angry with them. For 40 years later, they finally understood why the servant lamp went out when the temple itself was destroyed. Mm. But there is an earlier story of the servant lamp going out. And that is found back, way back in the early pages of 1 Samuel. Gary, tell us mm -hmm. about it. In the third chapter of 1 Samuel, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> we have a story. Uh, I'm going to read, in fact, the first uh, four verses of 1 Samuel 3. And the Lord, and the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time, when Eli was laid down in his place, that his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. J.R., here's a story that uh, it talks about uh, the Lord speaking to Samuel and the lamp beginning to go out. Mm -hmm. Most interesting. The, the, the story, the setting here for this story is that before the lamp of God went out in the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was, God came to Samuel and told him to give a message of doom to Eli. The message, of course, was that Eli's two sons were wicked and did not deserve the office of priest. And as the story goes, eventually Hophni and Phinehas took the Ark of the Covenant out into battle against the Philistines and lost it to the Philistines. Mm. And Hophni and Phinehas died in the process. Mm. When news came to Eli that his two sons were dead and the Ark of God was taken, Eli, being a rather large man, fell off of the stool where he was sitting next to the tabernacle tent door, fell backward and broke his neck and died. And when word of uh, Phinehas's death came to his wife, his wife, who was pregnant with child, gave birth to that child and died in childbirth, saying that the child should be named Ichabod. The glory hath departed. Gary, the lamp went out. When the glory departs, it not only departs in reality, but the very symbol of that glory, the servant lamp of the menorah, goes out. And J.R., that servant lamp is the most amazing lamp because it's, and it's called, as we've mentioned before, and we'll be talking about this several more times, that lamp is called the lamp of God. It yes. represents the Godhead, and it represents the work and person of Christ. It is called the servant lamp. It lights all the other lamps. Mm -hmm. And Jesus came as Messiah and servant. And so that lamp literally uh, illustrates his person. And mm -hmm. you know, J.R., when that lamp yeah. goes out, it indicates that there is sin in the camp. Yes. We just mentioned a couple of instances of that lamp going out. And really, that's all we need that's right. to let us know how that lamp works and what it means. 
There is a Middle Eastern legend of a lamp that belonged to Allah. A spirit or um, a genie possessed that lamp. And today, of course, it is known as the delightful story of Aladdin's lamp. But the very beginning of the name Aladdin is the word Allah. I want you to know it is not Allah's lamp, it is God's lamp. Mm. And the fascinating thing about it is the setting is around Babylon in the Middle East, appears to have come perhaps out of the Babylonian captivity and when the lamp of God and the, uh, the uh, candlesticks were taken off into Babylon, if it, you know, Solomon had 10 of these built in addition to the mosaic menorah. It is possible that one or more of these were taken off to Babylon. And from this story of the servant lamp of God cropped up this strange legend about mm. a lamp with a genie in it or a spirit in mm -hmm. it. And you would speak to the lamp and ask it a, a request and your request would be given to you. It's the same thing we Christians call praying as Aladdin rubbed the lamp and out popped this genie and said, I'll give you three wishes, whatever you want. <laughs> mm. And so you can see the similarity there of the story. I don't know how old that story is. It, it seems to go back into antiquity, however, a legend perhaps that came from the original story of the servant lamp of the menorah. Yeah, you know, J.R., that uh, the legend, uh, that is the legends associated with uh, the, the lamp. The Ara tales of the Arabian Nights, you know, date back to right around 1000 A.D., almost simultaneous with the, with the rise of Islam. And uh, it's easy to see how the legend of the servant lamp could be debased and turned into the legend of the lamp with the genie. As a matter of fact, all of the illustrations of that lamp look remarkably like the temple lamps that used to sit atop each branch of the lampstand. Now, you know, the fascinating thing about this servant lamp of the menorah is that it tells the story of the conflict between light and darkness. Perhaps we should call it the conflict of the servant lamps because there is one named Lucifer whose name means light bearer who was determined that he should be the light of the world and yet he was the prince of the darkness of this world. And you can see the play on words there. And it's fascinating that... Uh, uh, this story of the servant lamb mm -hmm. should be woven around the conflict of good and evil. We know from Scripture that title deed to planet Earth resides temporarily in the hands of Satan. In the early days, Satan was a glorious anointed cherub covered with jewels and precious things, as mentioned in Ezekiel. And as mentioned by Isaiah, we know that he was a very proud creature. He was literally one who bore the light of God. Uh, we read in Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nation? nations? Now, J.R., Lucifer, or light bearer, or illumined one here, suggests uh, that he was stealing God's fire, I guess to put it in contemporary language. Uh, he imagined that he could uh, cut out a piece of heaven for himself and declare himself God. And he literally stole fire from God, I think, uh, to illuminate himself. And one of the fascinating aspects of this story, this conflict between Jesus and Lucifer, this conflict between God and the devil, between light and darkness, or good and evil, is that the battlefield became planet Earth. But you see, the Earth is the fourth or middle of this string of heavenly bodies. We have the Sun, Mercury, Venus, and Earth. Earth is the fourth one. And beyond Earth are three more, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, to make up the seven. And so we have this fascinating menorah of our solar system with the Earth becoming the uh, the place of the conflict of good and evil. The servant lamp, if you please. As a matter of fact, Earth does become the place of conflict. And we should review just slightly that uh, whenever we see a menorah in Scripture, that is seven of something, you count four positions. One, two, three, four. The middle position of the menorah, the shamish, the servant lamp, is literally um, the picture of Christ literally the picture of the conflict between Christ and Satan. Christ the true light, Satan the false light. And by the way, J.R., 
It might be well to point out here that the word root in Hebrew, shamish, is <coughs> spelled exactly the same way as the Hebrew word for sun, shemish, mm -hmm. with a slightly different vowel pointing. So we're talking here about the sun being the original servant lamp and later on the conflict being shifted to planet Earth. During the days of Abraham, we are told in the Bible that there were seven times God appeared to Abraham. Each of those seven times were given. And in the course of these seven appearances, God called Abraham out of the year of Chaldees and gave him a covenant, the covenant of Abraham, that through him his seed would be a blessing to the world. And I recall from the scriptures that time when the Lord came to Abraham, you remember, and said, uh, look up at the stars. If you be able to tell the stars, that is, tell the story in the stars, so shall your seed be. Well, there were seven times then that God appeared to Abraham. Tell us about the fourth time and the servant lamp significance of it, Gary. And again, when we find seven of something in Scripture, we have learned not to see them as one through seven, but rather to see them as a group, a menorah, if you will. The fourth appearance of God to Abraham then would be the center light of the menorah. And if, uh, if our ideas hold, then it should follow that this fourth appearance of God to Abraham would illustrate the conflict of light versus darkness. And what do we read uh, during the uh, cutting of the covenant with Abraham, God's fourth appearance to Abraham? We read in uh, Genesis 15, 12, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And this is the setting then of the cutting of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, and we have the lamp of God going down between the pieces of the covenant to secure it. And J.R., when I hear the word lamp of God, I, I only think of one thing. Yes. The yes, center sir. light of the menorah. Amazing. Absolutely amazing that we have seven appearances of God to Abram, and the fourth time, the lamp of God came down. Hmm. And we find this um, all the way through the sevens of the Bible. This is just one illustration of the many fascinating sevens. Let's take, for example, the seven books. Um, actually, uh, there are 20, uh, 39 books of the Old mm -hmm. Testament that were at one time divided into 22 divisions. And these 22 books of the then uh, first through the third century Old Testament, as we call it, actually represent three menorahs. The first seven books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges, mm. tell the story of a servant lamb. They do indeed, J.R. <clears throat> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Again, counting these seven as a group rather than just a serial numbering of something, we look at the fourth or center position of the seven, J.R., we come to the book of Numbers. Mm -hmm. This, if there ever was a book that, that illustrates conflict between light and darkness, it would be the book of Numbers. Yes. For the original title of that book was In the Wilderness. So you can see the conflict of light and darkness. Here they fell under the judgment of God. It's almost as if the lamp of God went out in the Ooh, book of Numbers yeah. because they spent 40 years in the spiritual darkness of the uh, wilderness mm -hmm. rather than to enter into the kingdom, into the promised land. So the book of Numbers certainly suggests this center lamp going out because of the conflict of good and evil. Mm. And the people uh, failed. They, they failed to serve God. So we have this book of Numbers. You remember they came to Kadesh Barnea and uh, sent the 12 spies into the land to spy out the land. And they came back and Joshua and Caleb said, it's a beautiful land. God has given it to us. Let's go in and take it. But 10 of those 12 men said, oh no, we can't go in. They're giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers in their sights. And the hearts of the people melted. Here was the door to enter into the promised land at Kadesh Barnea and the people refused to enter the door. 
And that word door brings us to the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly the does. servant lamp position of the fourth letter. Yeah. And the fourth letter is Dalit. Yeah. The door into the holy land, the door into the promised land. Mm -hmm. And by the way, J.R., this reminds us of another theme that we're going to weave in with the menorah, as we do in the book. The title of the book being The Mystery of the Menorah and the Hebrew Alphabet. Now, Mm -hmm. Originally, the Old Testament uh, had 22 books. Today, 39. Originally, 22 books. The first seven, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and the seventh one was a combination of Judges and Ruth. The 20, when you group the books together the way they originally were, you come up with 22 books, each one of which corresponds to one of the letters, 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Mm -hmm. The fourth... Uh, it would be the letter Dalit. And it means door. Door. That's yeah. what's so fascinating about this letter Dalit. Indeed. Going to the second set of books in the Old Testament, we number this way the eighth, uh, the eighth uh, through the fifteenth. Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles were not first and second Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. Originally, they were just Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. And then Ezra and Nehemiah would be another book. And that would be the servant lamp of that menorah. And that would be the fourth position or servant lamp of that menorah. Esther, Job, and Psalms would be the, the final three. And J.R., once again, in the center position, the Shamish position, the servant lamp position of that seven lamp menorah, we find the conflict of light and darkness, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh -huh. And uh, they had to do with the rebuilding of the temple mm -hmm. and the restoration of the servant lamp Absolutely. and the, uh, the light of God. In this set of seven uh, divisions of the, the second set of seven divisions of the Old Testament, Samuel through Psalms, we have in the book of Samuel the first one representing the first lamp of the seven the servant lamp goes out. We mm -hmm. read that in yes. Samuel 3, chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we can see the continuing conflict. And of course, we know that the end of Chronicles, right at the last chapter of the Chronicles, we have them going into Babylonian captivity. Same thing again. The servant lamp goes out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> see, the glory leaves. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fascinating study how this servant lamp is always there, right at the right time, at the right point, to be snuffed out mm -hmm. as the people fail to serve God. And then we come to the final division, uh, Proverbs through the Minor Prophets. Mm -hmm. And Gary, at one time, the minor prophets were considered to be one book. That's right. And Lamentations was attached to the end of Jeremiah. So you see, we brought 39 books down to 22. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruth was attached to Judges. Ezra and Nehemiah were one book. Uh, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles were one book each. And uh, Lamentations was attached to Jeremiah. And all 12 minor prophets were considered to be one book. So 39 books become 22 and correspond to the letters of the, 20, of the Hebrew alphabet. Fascinating thing about this is that these uh, letters of the Hebrew alphabet uh, picture the Old Testament books as they are in the order of the table of contents in our Bibles. That's right. All you have to do is combine the books that were, that were split up, such as First and Second Kings, combine them back mm -hmm. to their original. The Twelve Minor Prophets become one book called the Twelve. Mm -hmm. And this brings us to the final division of the Old Testament, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, which is, is as J.R. mentioned, combined with Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the Twelve Minor Prophets. But J.R., something interesting unfolds here because the last division is not seven. It's eight. Yeah. It's eight books. How can we reconcile this? What do we do to reconcile a menorah of eight lamps? Well, obviously, um, God was moving the seven lamps toward eight. Uh, there is a story that uh, came up about 168 years before the birth of Christ. Uh, during the days of the Maccabees, and uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian general, had taken over Jerusalem. 
he sacrificed swine on the altar in the temple. Can you imagine such a thing? Desecrating the temple. And he stole the menorah and took it off to Syria. Well, this sparked a rebellion. And Judas Maccabeus, for three years, fought against the Syrians and Antiochus Epiphanes. After three years, they were able to drive the Syrians out of the land, came into the temple, brought in another menorah, and Gary, there are stories that that menorah was made out of lead, mm. that they just put it together very hurriedly because they didn't have any gold. And they built these seven lamps, they brought them into the, uh, uh, in, into the temple, they had curtains over the doors because the, the beautiful doors were gone. I mean, mm -hmm. it had been stripped by this, the Syrians and everything were of, of any value was taken off to Syria. And they found one day's oil supply. It would take eight days for more oil to be made from olives, mm -hmm. olive oil used in the burning of the menorah. And uh, the fascinating thing is mm -hmm. Judas Maccabeus didn't want to wait. So he told them to put the oil in the lamps and light them anyway. And for the next eight days, those seven lamps of the menorah burned on one day's oil supply mm. for eight days. And from that then came a new festival. Judas Maccabeus said, since we have a miracle from God, we should observe this day from now on throughout our generations. And they chose what we call December 25th, the 24th day of Keslev mm -hmm. in that day, which was the same day three years earlier when Antiochus Epiphanes had desecrated the temple. And they called that the Feast of Dedication or the Feast of Lights. Today it is called Hanukkah. Eight lamps with a servant lamp, a total of nine. Yeah, I was going to say, you have once again the servant lamp in the center, only this time four lamps on each side. And J.R., that number eight is intimately associated with the redemptive work of Christ, with grace, with yes. the name, the person, the work of Jesus, uh, and it's associated with grace. And so the seven lamp uh, menorah given to Moses is a menorah associated with the Mosaic Covenant. The nine lamp uh, menorah that uh, is associated with Hanukkah speaks of grace. Mm -hmm. and so we have the 22 books of the Old Testament representing three menorahs, two seven-lamp menorahs followed by an eight-lamp menorah because grace was on its way.